Every company wants to grow. In this next panel, you'll hear how three senior leaders are doing that at their companies, how they are driving that hypergrowth. They'll talk about the techniques they've used to overcome the challenges in the growing digital economy. So to moderate, please welcome for today's panel, App Direct General Manager, Emmanuel Bertolin. <laughs> Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm a big Naomi fan. <laughs> I'm a big Naomi fan. Let's give her a hand. Well, that was awesome. But I have a bit of a challenge. OK. Yeah, because yesterday after the lunch break, you said that the session after lunch was the most difficult session. I, you did. I did, I did. I would argue <laughs> the morning session after a night in Montreal is a lot tougher to host and okay. moderate. Right? Right. I'll, uh, I'll give you that much. We all can right. talk about this later. All right, we'll talk later because right. I, th I, I got this one, I think. I mean, I think we all practiced endurance last night. Um, <laughs> dining endurance, uh, maybe a bit of drinking endurance, some of us. But we're here to talk about digital endurance. And uh, we have a great uh, panel assembled to talk about it. So I'm going to bring them on stage and get started. So our first panelist is Lutz Froelich from Deutsch Telekom. Right on. Right on. For you. Our next panelist is Chris Wooden from Soft Choice. Our final panelist is Jagesh Saheba from ADP. Well, we're all in a quest for growth. We're, um, we're actually obsessed with growth. You know, we sit around our boardroom tables, we talk about markets, customers, segments. We're all looking for ways that we can grow. And so we've assembled a panel today of uh, top execs from diverse companies. We have Top Telco, a technology service provider, effectively a software company. And they're going to bring different aspects of uh, growth and, uh, to the table here. And, and, and furthermore, the panel has a bit of diversity in terms of their sort of experiences with AppDirect. I mean, we've got Lutz, who has been with uh, AppDirect for, I think, six years now. Yeah. In fact, I think Lutz has probably been on the, uh, the engaged stage over the years more than most AppDirect employees, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris just joined the AppDirect family this year, and we're very early in our relationship. And of course, ADP has been with us for a number of years as well. So we have a pretty broad mix. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the key thing is we want this group to share frameworks, techniques that they've developed over the years to grow and really talk about challenges, how you've overcome them. And, and then finally, we'll try to probe some wisdom for everybody who's just getting started out from some of the things that you've, you've learned over the years. So that's really the, uh, the plan for the panel. Um, before we get started, maybe I'd like each of you to just do a quick intro in your role in the organization to sort of frame the context of where you're coming from to, with some of your answers. So Lutz, can we start with you? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, actually, my team has two roles in the organization. The, the first one is delivering cloud services and corresponding professional services to our segments, or NETCOs, how we call them, which is predominantly onboard partners, lifecycle partners, and build propositions around their offering. Yep. And uh, the second role is we operate all the digital touch points in Germany for all cloud and security services. So also for those services which are not delivered by my unit, but through other units, which basically means we run the cloud portal. We have a very big portal, which is called Telecom Cloud. We operate the sales service and marketing automation layer. And I'm also responsible for the cloud customer care first and second level. Great. So. Thanks. Chris? Yeah, so I lead business development and alliances at SoftChoice, and basically what that means is we help to form the long-term corporate strategy and how to execute it near term. 
uh, through the development of new offerings and capabilities uh, meeting our customer needs. Uh, my team also has responsibility for providing all the pre-sale support behind our joint offers with other technology partners, and we manage our relationship with key alliance partners like Microsoft, Cisco, HP, uh, Google, etc. Uh, um, I'm with ADP since 2002. Um, I pioneered the creation of the ADP marketplace, and our mission is to create an ecosystem around ADP. And we, we tend to view this ecosystem in, a, in a two different ways. We want to deliver the best digital experience for our customers and, and consumers, but we also want to leverage our partners' capabilities and innovation and embrace them into, into our ecosystem. So my team uh, builds the platform, we onboard partners on the platform, and we make them successful that we collectively can address our customers' needs. All right, well, let's get started with some questions. So, so let's, DT's had great success over the last six years. Can you share some of the, some of the ways that you drove that success? Yeah, if I, if I summarize or our journey over the last six years, I think there are four key success drivers I would differentiate. Two more around hunting, which is building up an omni-channel and, and deliver a service wrapper around. The two others, or the third and the fourth one is customer success management and um, basically unlocking the ecosystem, how we call it. So if we talk about sales, I mean, we heard a lot about this already yesterday, and I guess every company has to find this own setting, given basically their capabilities. What worked for us, and it actually literally took us years to find the right setting, is developing what we call an omni-channel. So we have a quite extensive field force um, in Germany, but these are telco sellers, so not very good in IT. Mm -hmm. But they're good in opening the door, basically, to the customer. They manage the customer relationship, and if you give them the right stories, they're able to introduce a topic. Then, then we have a very specialized inside sales teams, which then basically moves in into the sales process and, and converts the customers by using also a lot of digital self-care interfaces. Um, and two things were quite important in setting this up. I mean, the first one is we have now a very sophisticated sales service and marketing automation through which we basically steer the customer journey in all the channels through the different touch points. The second one is we decided a couple of years for a clear what we call consumption first strategy. So we basically incentivized sales to say, okay, your task is to get a customer on board. You know, even a trial is fine. From that, we will work on and start converting customers, bring other services in there. Um, and that was, of course, quite difficult. And if you talk to a traditional salesperson, um, about uh, hunting uh, trials for subscriptions. That's not so funny, mm -hmm. but <laughs> eventually, I mean, the, the success proof that was the right strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's about sales. The second service wrapper, um, I mean, selling a solution or an offering is, is one thing. The other thing is really um, ensuring that customers are able to work with it. So there's a lot of migration in their assistance, and um, I think it's one of our core differentiators, and we spend a lot on building a very good remote service, and we also have a kind of local portfolio with local fulfillment partners if customers want service on-prem. Um, then if we talk customer success management, that was not so important in the first years, um, but quite important since I would say 24 months, 36 months, something like that, when we have started to build a significant base. Um, to really constantly be in contact with customers and, and develop them. I think for the IT folks, this is quite natural. In the telco environment, not. So when we started, we had a CRM strategy. We said, okay, we max contact a customer two times a year. Because, I mean, in Europe, we are a clear carrier. So we sell tariff packages, and then, you know, you're in for 24 months, and typically right. we try, and try to touch you. So now walking around and telling basically the management, you know, I need significant budget to contact now customers not only two, three times a year, but two, three times a week. Um, and they will love it because I will have great content and it also costs a lot of money. That was also not easy. Um, but eventually, I think it was one of the, the major um, success drivers. And finally, um, and, and now we have actually 50% of our growth comes actually through the base every month. 
um, which is quite significant. And, and the fourth thing is unlocking the ecosystem, which is something where we have started, I would say, mid of last year, really to try to build new applications on top of the existing base. We work a lot on penetrating the Microsoft ecosystem to the max, so everybody talks about Office 365. In fact, these are 600 SKUs yeah. all over, so, yeah. Can you, can you share a bit more on how you evaluate these ecosystem products and how you decide which ones to bring to market? Yeah. I mean, in, in general, let's say the way we treat the portfolio or partners changed over the years in, in terms of portfolio decisions, pricing, as well as integration. So when we started, we just looked for, talked to every ISV, you know, whether we like the application, usability, features, things like that. Um, uh, but now it's more like them. what we found out is, I mean, first, we're not able to sell 20, 30, 40 different things. So we just, at, at least in the hunting side. For hunting, our sales reps are able to work with five to six. And, and to be frank, these are the big names. It's Microsoft, it's Cisco, yeah. it's Salesforce. I mean, this yeah. is what our guys are able to right, bring right. to the customers. And then we have to start to develop on that. And that now we start, if we talk now to, to ISVs, it's not so much, okay, what is, are your features? More like, where do you belong to? Yeah. Do you belong to the Salesforce environment, or you to the SAP guys, or to uh, Office? Or it could be they're, they are basically alone, and it's more the question, okay, what would be your natural partners? You know, where right. could you integrate to? Because you know, one yeah. alone is not interesting. Um, it's more like we need to find other applications which work together. For example, a good example is, is mobile services. Um, we started last year with adding some partners with, with um, timesheet management and expense management and you know, all these kind of things which are there for mobile, mobile companies. And actually it didn't work out at the beginning. Too difficult to sell to customers. Um, and then we added beginning of the year two new partners, um, SMAP1 and BlueZone, which have a kind of low-code applications to simply digitize processes in a mobile manner, just, you know, typical Excel mm -hmm. processes, things like that. And that totally changed the game, because now it was easier for the sales guys to start a story. They didn't have to go to the customer and say, okay, we would like to sell you an expense management right. application. It's more like, do you have a problem which really annoys you? We will help you. And then again, it's the lead, then we have to work on it together with a partner. Then we have basically the first process built up, and then you can start and say, okay, this process would be even better if we plug DocuSign in. Mm -hmm. Or you could say on the next process, well, okay, this is a process for timesheet management, but you know, we also have a SaaS partner, which is even better. It costs a bit more, but yeah, it might be good. Yeah. And now the whole story develops, so we turn it around. But two things are important to drive something like that. I mean, first, also it's a pricing thing. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, we didn't care about prices. So ISVs decided on the pricing scheme, and we agreed a, a ref share, um, and then we had some cosmetics, so that is not 7.37 euros, something like that, and, and off you go. But now, if you think in this ecosystem environment, it gets much more difficult. But if, if you go to the customer and say, okay, with one application costs 5 euro 50, the second costs 7 euro 95, the third one costs 200, but there are 10 seats in there, it gets very difficult. Yeah. So now we build price plans where we say, okay, you get a mobile service kit. For five euro, you can decide you know, one out of five applications. Or for 10 euro, you can decide for two out of 10 applications. And now we have to talk with our ISVs to say, okay, nice application, but I need an application which costs <laughs> 494. Mine is our ref share. Are you able to deliver on that? And a lot of ISVs are not very happy about this discussion, but that's basically the, right, right. the way it, yeah. it goes. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, look, that's awesome. Awesome insights. Jagesh, there was a recent uh, Forrester's report that came out, and it highlighted the ADP marketplace, and it was alongside Amazon, Microsoft, Salesforce, and Oracle. So you're keeping pretty good company. Pretty good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so as a leader and innovator of this marketplace, can, can you share a little bit of how you guys achieved that? Uh? Yeah, it's a tremendous honor uh, to be uh, among that uh, elite uh, companies. Um, so our strategy has been to build a sustainable ecosystem, right? That's, f that's, the, that's the challenge that, that we had when we started in 2014. And we wanted to build an ecosystem that is meaningful from a customer perspective, right? the end customers of ADP perspective. 
So we looked at this ecosystem from two aspects. One is that we want to simplify and digitize the experience for our end customers, that they can come to ADP, discover, find, uh, try products and services easily and quickly and realize the benefits of those solutions. On the other side, we wanted to build an ecosystem where we can onboard partners onto our ecosystem quickly, bring their innovation to our ecosystem quickly. We're trying to address the pain points of customers. Typical customers of ADP would have dozens of systems managing their human capital. And we know that we cannot be the end of all. And so what we wanted to do is to curate the content, the types of partners, type of application, that complete the portfolio for our customers. Right? In a lot of vertical industries like hospitality, manufacturing, we actively go seek out partners that specialize in those industries, help them integrate it tightly with ADP, and make it meaningful to our customers. Yeah, that's great stuff. I know we have a, we have a video that uh, really illustrates how the marketplace is in action, and I, and, and I think it's made a real impact on a lot of small businesses, medium-sized businesses. So if we could run that video now and, and kind of uh, show that. Daily pay is best described as an ATM for your own earnings. Employers use our technology to provide access for their employees to receive their earned and unpaid wages. Sprinkles is a nationwide bakery that bakes fresh cupcakes every day. Beyond cupcakes, we've also got ice cream, cookies, layer cakes as well. Over 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, and that's a real problem. What we are dedicated to doing is really solving that issue. For a company of about 650 employees, we only have a handful of HR professionals. We like to spend our time taking care of our team and not fiddling with systems. Since we've started to use daily pay, we've definitely seen an increase in retention, particularly with our part-time population. Daily pay helped me to control how much I'm spending on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes bills are due before payday. People do need extra money, and sometimes the two weeks doesn't really cut it. This is all made possible by world-class technology powered by ADP, so that providers like ourselves can seamlessly connect into ADP Marketplace to meet the needs of our mutual clients. There are automatic feeds that are happening between the systems without manpower, which is great. ADP is absolutely best in class by helping employees be more engaged. Through ADP Marketplace, Sprinkles can simply turn on the software and now every single employee can access their wages on their own schedule. This enables the employees to pay their bills on time, avoid late fees, and in turn, they wind up staying longer. An individual at one of our bakeries called in sick to work because their car broke down. And I received a thank you note from this individual about daily pay because instead of having to wait until that next paycheck, they were able to immediately withdraw funds from the hours they had worked and they could get their car fixed that day. Both daily pay and ADP in particular can really help us to simplify people's daily lives and continue to take care of people in the right way. I see daily pay as being the future of how people get paid, and I think more companies and employers should go for it. We're thrilled to be able to work with ADP to help us reach our goal of creating the first steps towards financial security for the most number of people in the country. All right. Well, aside from wanting a cupcake, <laughs> can you maybe share some thoughts yeah. on that? That's a... so. Uh, it's a, this is an excellent example of the recipe, right? There is a, a small business, right? They don't have deep, uh, or they don't have the resources to afford an HR uh, practitioner on site, right? They have these high turnover. It's a small business. It's a restaurant industry. High turnover. Employees need this. Uh, you can say this is an innovative way to pay yeah. employees. And um, so it's a sweet spot uh, in terms of restaurant industry. We didn't have a solution, partner did, right? A perfect example of how a, we are able to seek partners who address the specific needs of our clients and they bring innovation to our ecosystem and our platform is enabling that. Great stuff, great stuff. Well, Chris, let's switch over to you. So SoftChoice has had tremendous growth over the last 30 years. And 
you're continually now looking to transform yourself yet again, and you've selected AppDirect uh, to help you. Can you share a little bit about how, how you're gonna continue your growth and what your plans are? Yeah, so uh, this is indeed our 30 year anniversary, uh, and the company has evolved tremendously over that period of time. And for the last 10 years, our focus and success has been driven by designing, delivering, managing solutions that help mid-size and large enterprise uh, organizations securely adopt the right hybrid IT strategy or end user productivity solutions. And in this way, we were helping our customers to digitally transform or enabling them to digitally transform themselves. But the truth is the way we were delivering these solutions to customers was not transformed. It's the way we had always been delivering solutions to customers, which is, you know, represented by very long sales cycles, very large upfront transactions that then entitle that customer to the technology and the services for the next three to five years, and there's a long period of time to deploy and adopt. And the reality is, as we all know, that's increasingly not how our target customers want to consume technology. So we knew that we had to transform the way we're delivering technology into a more agile subscription-based uh, model. The challenge we have is that our systems and processes have been iterating for 30 years in the old world, and we simply did not have the ability to deliver uh, our business model through our existing systems and processes. So we needed first a technology partner who could augment uh, all of the value and wealth inside of our existing systems and processes, uh, and of course AppDirect uh, fit that need. Uh, not only because of the incredible experience you create for the end user on top of what SoftRace does, but because of the ability to constantly iterate the integration of AppDirect into our systems and processes, which themselves are in constant change. But the other thing we really needed was a business partner. Uh, someone who's worked with other businesses like SoftRace who have gone through this type of transformation and seen what works and what doesn't. And one of the things that we really appreciated early in our journey with AppDirect was the willingness of, of your leadership team to challenge us and uh, make sure that we didn't uh, you know, fall victim to some of the uh, issues that many of our peers have faced in this journey. Yeah, yeah, great. So you talk about you know, transitioning now and so you wanna sell software more in a subscription model, right? Can you talk a little bit about you know, the, the challenges, especially maybe in your sales organization, right? Where you're going from large deals where I'm assuming there's some large compensation that, that's happening, and now you're moving to more of a subscription-based model. And how, how do you transition that? Yeah, so for perspective, you know, let me go into a little bit more detail what this old world of soft choice and our customer relationship looked like. Um, you know, this old world was built on very large transactions uh, that would take months to develop, and once the customer was ready to move forward, they would write one huge check for the entitlement of infrastructure technology, software licensing, soft choice professional and managed services. Um, and a great example of, of what that looks like in our industry is the Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, which I'm sure many people in this room have been a customer of or a provider of some sort. And as you likely know, Microsoft does a great job of selling these EAs with far more technology than you plan on acquiring and way more technology than you ever end up using. We got kind of good at that. And, um, and then we would you know, uh, you know, align that with uh, services that would help the customer to deploy. Well, in this new world, these customers do not want to acquire and adopt technology in that way. They want to start smaller, with smaller groups inside the organization without having to make an enterprise-wide commitment. They want to iterate additional functionality as customers demand it, uh, or their end users demand it. And uh, you know, going back to the Microsoft example, that is now represented in this new world with CSP, the Cloud Solution Provider Program, which gives us the ability to get customers started much more quickly uh, in a more controlled way. The challenge that creates for us going from the old to the new world is that you know, we have compensation plans that reward those big bang transactions. And we have uh, not only systems and process issues, which we've already discussed having to solve, but cultural issues. We hired people to do these things, to go elephant hunting, and we train them to do that. So we've also had to change the way that we uh, inspire our sales organization, the way that we train them. Of course, we've had to make changes to compensation, which is very delicate because you don't want to take, you know, too much uh, change uh, since they inevitably feel like you're, you know, screwing them somehow. Yeah. 
And then, um, and then, and then we've even had to change the hiring profile uh, into folks that uh, you know approach customers in this way. So those are some of the biggest changes we've had to make to the uh, employee and in, in, in internal experience. Yeah, I mean, it is a real cultural shift, isn't it? You're dealing with a lot of elements. And, and Jagesh, you know, um, Chris talked about the changes to, you know, the sales team and stuff. What about at ADP in terms of people and processes? Have you seen a lot of uh, changes you've had to make in, in the people and processes there? I think, I think the, fundamentally there's a mind shift, right? Uh, uh, we've been a broad spectrum ATM provider. And, uh, you know, it, it, over time, you know, it feels like uh, you, you're doing everything. And I think realization that we cannot do everything, right? There's a lot of innovation that's happening outside of our, our company boundaries. And creating a framework or and possibility of embracing them and quickly bringing to the market uh, was a big fundamental change that, that we had to go through. Uh, and in a lot of ways, we're creating a win-win-win situation uh, for, uh, for consumers, just like what you saw here with Sprinkles. They get the solution they need. Uh, partners get a distribution through ADP uh, uh, you know, to a large client base of ours. And ADP uh, you know, it builds an ecosystem where we have seen a direct evidence of when a client of ours has uh, a, a connection through marketplace uh, to a third party product, right, the retention is substantially higher. And that's a tremendous benefit over the lifetime of a, of a client. Uh, but it requires a fundamental change, right? It requires change from the way we architect our systems, the way we think about API first, the way we think about integration, exposing some of this capability in an API form where partner can engage in a meaningful way and build integration that is tighter, that is seamless, and it just makes sense. Um, so, you know, both sides of the change, I know there's a lot of change in terms of how we market, right? We have never marketed partner products before. We're building that competency as we speak. Uh, and then how do you, how do you get sales force uh, of ADP to rally around this? How do you ingrain into their tool sets uh, so they can see these third-party add-on products, third-party products that they can bundle together. And we are beginning to see the signs of this bundle concept really take on at ADP, where a salesperson can go into client site and say, here's the anchor product of ADP, let's say HR payroll benefits. And now in your industry, these are the 10, 5, 10 products from our partner network that makes sense, they work together, they integrate it, and it will really address some of the big needs of yours. Yeah, I mean, uh, super interesting. Maybe just to pivot a bit, like if you think of your, your customer and partner experiences as well, mm -hmm. right? You need to make sure that, I guess, you delight both those audiences, right, for success. So what, what, have, what have you done to really you know, try to drive that experience? So, so I'll address the customer, customers, the end customers of ours first. You know, if you search HCM or payroll or any, anything related to human capital management, right, if you do a Google search, you'll see hundreds of products pop up, right? You really don't know which one, you know, is the right product for you. So one thing that we have, we are doing quite well now is being able to curate the content when you come to our marketplace. Right, so we know a lot about you. We know your size. We know where you're located. We know which industry you, you are in. And we know the partner products. We know our partners very well. So matchmaking, you know, we're doing better and better job on our marketplace. On the other side, with the partners, right, partners want to get to the marketplace as quickly as possible, right? Every time we talk to a new partner, it's like, how long is it going to take for me to list my product on your marketplace and get it to your client base, right? And we've been, we've been telling them that, hey, not too fast, integrate, right? Leverage our single sign-on, integrate, do the data integration. Let's, let's, let's create a better integration between our systems. And that will, uh, you know, that will give you a, a head start as well as you know, from a competitive nature, this, this will put you in the forefront, right? Compared to all the other products that exist in the marketplace, claiming your product integrates with the ADP and the core systems from ADP uh, is very meaningful. 
So we've been focusing a lot on the partner journey and automating that journey, providing tool sets, technologies, know-how, and in a lot of cases, white glove service to select partners to get them into, the, uh, into our ecosystem, completely integrated, right? Uh, we are marketing, we are providing sales assistance. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a you know, comprehensive approach to partnership that, that we have, you know, with, with that we have formulated that's proving tremendously valuable now. So let's, Jigesh talked about, you know, the, the customer experience a bit, and, and obviously self-serve is a desire we all aspire to get to, uh, but we know right now there's a lot of assisted selling happening. Uh, but we're starting to see some customers have success with self-serve. Have you, have you seen self-serve uh, start to benefit <coughs> or happen in, on, on, at DT? Yeah, actually we see that. I mean, especially, again, on the customer development side. So on on getting or hunting customers. I think we have an online share of 20%, which is actually quite good compared to our traditional business. But probably we will be not able to drive it more because then actually the cost of sale will be higher than actually the, the, the profit. Um, however, on uh, customer development, I think the self-share rate is about 60% right now. Um, uh, and, and there is some assistance there, but it's very much, as I said, driven from this very sophisticated customer journey composition. For example, around for Microsoft, we have around 60 customer journeys with 10 to 15 touch points live, mm -hmm. which we constantly A-B test and develop um, and improve. And, and that actually works quite well. But we also see it's, it's a kind of, uh, we constantly have to develop it. You know, it's not something there is a self-care interface, and then everybody thinks, okay, now it's easy, you know, save a lot of money. Actually, no, it's very, very expensive. You need content, um, and then you need tools to, for personalized content, and then you need data, and then you need to manage the data, and then you want to have bots in there to optimize the interaction, and so on and so on. Um, so I think there is a big opportunity but it's not so easy to lift. That's why, we're, for example, we also start thinking about new business models. So, for example, integrating our partners much more in designing the customer journey and taking parts over it. Or um, we're also discussing internally like asset share models um, where with other service providers to think about, okay, can we use same content base and normalize data to train algorithms and things like that. So that I think this is something which will come to drive this ecosystem even more. Great. Chris, coming back to you, uh, can you talk a little bit more about you know, impacts digital transformations having on the org and, and really, especially your customer experience, I guess? Yeah, so I think, uh, and, and this builds perfectly off the point Les just made, I, you know, I think we all know that this transition to consumption ex economics uh, really requires an improvement in customer success. I think the challenge is understanding what that means for our business and our customers and all the different ways that we serve them. One of the reasons that customer success has become so important to us in this transition is that uh, unlike the old world where you know, the customer was contractually committed to a certain amount of technology and a plan from software to deploy it, in this new world, even though it's much easier to get started and ha have that happen uh, mm -hmm. more quickly, it's that much easier to stop because they don't have sunk cost in the technology. They're not contractually you know, required to utilize your managed services or anything of that nature. And so you really have to work harder and more creatively to uh, keep that customer. Now, similar to you, let's, I could design the most perfect customer success experience. I know exactly what that looks like. And if we deployed it, the customers would love it. And then we'd be bankrupt in two months. Yes. <laughs> because doing that at scale and maintaining profitability is really tough. In our case, uh, we had to design an entirely new customer success framework as we started to transition to this subscription-based agile model of te uh, delivering technology solutions built on AppDirect, which we actually launched earlier this year under our brand called Enterprise Lifecycle Management. That's our yeah. success framework for customer success. And one of the challenges that we're meeting inside this new customer success framework is determining of the over 10,000 customers that buy something from SoftChoice, how we tailor the experience to each one of those customers automatically based on what they're acquiring and how they're acquiring it from us. And through that automation, I can prescribe you know, what the right agenda is, who needs to be involved in those touch points with what resources, what services, and start to monitor how well we are 
uh, executing that customer success plan around the, the transaction activity that we see through uh, the AppDirect platform. Um, so that, that's a major change that we've had to make in order to keep up with the new demands of the customer experience in this, in this new world. Yeah, great stuff. I mean, it's never easy. Uh, uh, so let's close out with uh, maybe some words of wisdom. And Jagesh, we'll start with you. So what are some of the challenges you see for, for growth and continued growth in the coming years? So um, a couple of things. Uh, data privacy, I, I guess it's probably on top of everybody's mind, right? Uh, GDPR and a lot of changes that, that are coming up. Um, and we're trying to tackle that, right? We don't, uh, we're trying to kind of uh, face it head on. When you have a growing ecosystem and when you have these, all these connected parts, right? Privacy and how do you ensure privacy and security throughout your ecosystem uh, uh, is very important, right? We are the, we are the platform. Uh, the clients are discovering these products from our marketplace, right? There is a level of trust that our clients have uh, with ADP. And, and we're doing a lot of things to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, that trust is maintained. So security assessments, uh, uh, putting partners through a rigorous process, making sure that integrations are tight and secure uh, is, is paramount. And, and I, I do see you know, that uh, adds delay to some extent to onboarding for partner, but it's, it's absolutely necessity. But I think, I think that's a very complex environment in terms of the headwinds uh, that you know, at a growing ecosystem will have to face. And on the, on the data privacy, um, we're thinking about ways that we can collect consent um, in a proper way where the data can still flow because I think integrations are meaningful and interoperability is achievable, uh, but we don't want to be blocked by data privacy. So being uh, providing consent management as the feature of your platform is absolutely critical. And maintaining that and giving control to the clients so they understand exactly what data is being shared, how they can govern or how they can control this data access to, to whatever network that they created through our platform. That's another uh, com complex area that we're trying to kind of face head on. But I see you know, th this, and, and the last is standardization, right? I think any ecosystem, just like, you know, like you're driving on the road, there are rules and standardization goes a long way. And in industry like ours, where there are many, many players, of course we have uh, bodies who establish interoperability standards, but there's no one clear voice in terms of, in terms of a strength. So can ADP play a role in standardizing some of these interfaces, some of these API specifications? So we're kind of facing that head on and trying to impact our industry in a much bigger way. Yeah, I think standardization is actually really interesting. And I think many industries have learned that you know, the rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's gonna be a challenge. And I think we're still in a fairly new market. And as things mature, we may see that. Uh, let's, uh, what advice might you give somebody who's just getting started out in their journey? Because you are one of the endurers who've done this for quite a while. <clears throat> I mean, I would say start, start small and, and really think about a, a story or a narrative which fits to your business and your strengths. Because, I mean, one risk with starting with such a powerful platform and the App Direct platform is then you have access to loads of partners and loads of different sales capabilities. You could do direct, indirect, reseller, online. And I think it's a bit the trap we filled in at the beginning that we just, you know, onboarded a lot of different partners. We tried to disrupt our existing sales channels and try to be very digital and that didn't work. And only if we really basically went through a kind of turnaround program to say, okay, we will focus on some partners. Now we concentrate on enhancing and empowering our existing channels and not bypassing them, then it works. So I can only tell everybody, think about what really fits to your core business and then evolve from that and not directly think into disrupting that is one thing. The other thing, and Nicholas had mentioned it yesterday, I think he called it the human element or something like that. It's, it's also what we've learned within the assisted sales or with a powerful customer care. I mean, everything is about digitization and transaction, but let's say our customers, B2B customers in the 
mid-market sp still expect human touch points. Um, and it's important that you invest in very good human touch points. That's our experience. So we treat our customer care people really like heroes, and, um, and they're really good. So they, they are a, a, a big supporter of the growth. And um, yeah, and finally, start early about success management. Even if you don't have success, when it will come, you need to work on that. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, I mean, we've heard repeatedly that you know, yeah. software is sold; it's uh, not bought, right? And I think it does it does take that human element. Chris, when you look back at your first engage last year, and you were here in the audience uh, thinking about App Direct and evaluating and determining. You know, what, what advice could you give for someone who's here for their first time and, and, and looking? Yeah, I, I remember it really well last year when we were in San Francisco, being in the audience and being very excited about all the opportunity that was being presented to us to transform the business and differentiate from competition. But my colleague Jason and I were equally overwhelmed by what we would do next. Where do we start? <laughs> because there were so many areas we could get started and I think we were thinking through all the risk of getting started. And uh, over the last year, our experience, what I would share with you now, if you're early on in you know, your, your transformation like we were, it would be to start small, exactly like you said. Uh, don't try to solve all the company's problems with one solution quickly. Uh, pick one that you know you can prove financially success and that you can influence success and get the rest of the company wanting more from that and asking why don't we go bigger. And in our case, that, that resulted in us really focusing in on how we transform the way that we deliver Office 365 solutions to our customers. And now we're starting to build around that all of the other ecosystem services and, and ISV products that can lift that. As we're doing that, now the business is coming back and saying, well, why aren't we doing that with infrastructure as a service solutions? And, and so um, my advice would be start small where you know you can manufacture success and get the company and your customers coming back wanting more. Great stuff. Well, look, gentlemen, uh, I think you've provided some great insight to, to, the, to our audience, and I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to spend, uh, spend uh, uh, you know, on stage with us. Thank you so much. A big hand for, for this panel. <laughs>